Hi there. In this video, we're going to explode one of the most pervasive and enduring myths about learning, the learning pyramid, sometimes referred to as the cone of learning. Either way, it's complete nonsense. Continue to watch this video if you want to find out why. You'll probably recognise the depiction of a learning pyramid that currently appears on screen, or at least some version of it. There are lots of variations around the theme, but more often than not, the differences are aesthetic. Conceptually, and usually also the percentage retention figures that they all cite, tend to be very similar, if not identical. They all have the following in common. They list a series of learning activities. They arrange them in the form of a pyramid. Against each of these learning activities, there is a percentage figure that purports to represent the amount of material that someone will retain if they use that particular learning activity. The activities that promote the greatest amount of retention are at the base of the pyramid, and those that promote the least amount of retention appear at the top of the pyramid. If you've previously looked at an example of a learning pyramid and thought to yourself, well that seems to make sense, that's completely understandable. Like many myths about learning, the learning pyramid has an immediate and simple intuitive appeal. How many of us haven't sat for a boring lecture and thought to ourselves, well, I've remembered absolutely nothing from that content? In contrast, how many of us have learned something that's valuable to us, predominantly by doing or practicing, for example, perhaps learning to play a musical instrument? Also, it's not like we can blame well-intentioned but non-academic and non-peer-reviewed internet sources for the pervasiveness of the learning pyramid. In a review of the literature, Lettred and Hernes in 2016 found 418 peer-reviewed journal articles and 11 encyclopedia entries that propagated some form of the learning pyramid. So if the learning pyramid has good intuitive appeal and seems to have gained quite a lot of traction in the academic literature, then why am I referring to it as a learning myth? Well, I think there are three main categories of problems with the learning pyramid. The first category of problems relates to the way that it is conceptualized. The second category of problems relates to the evidence for it, or rather the lack of evidence for it. And the third category of problems relates to the fact that it's incongruent with many decades of theory and research about memory from cognitive psychology. So let's expand on some of these problems in a bit more detail. Perhaps the biggest conceptual problem with learning pyramids is that they are almost invariably unclear on exactly what it is that's being measured. Many of them refer to terms such as remembering or retention. But what exactly do these mean? Are they referring to recall or recognition or both? That's a key distinction in psychological research on memory. Also, what kind of intervals of retention are we talking about here? An hour, a day, a month, a year? This is another key issue because research has shown us that short-term performance is often not indicative of longer-term learning. A big conceptual problem with the learning pyramid is that it conceptualizes the learning activities as discrete entities, when in point of fact they're not. When was the last time you attended a lecture that didn't involve some presentation of audio-visual material in the form of PowerPoint slides or videos, for example? Now, in those instances, how much retention of material is that lecture producing? Is it the 5% of retention that's associated with lectures? Is it the 25% of retention that's associated with audio-visual material? Or is it a combination of the two, i.e. are the effects of the learning activities additive? In other words, they would promote 30% total retention of material. Another big conceptual problem with the learning pyramid is its overly simplistic nature. Think for a moment about all the different types of factors that can be at play in memory research. You have factors associated with the characteristics of the learner. You have factors associated with the characteristics of the material to be studied. You have factors associated with differences in the practice or implementation of the different learning activities. Given all of this variation, just having one single mean retention figure for each of the learning activities that collapses across all of these things seems rather meaningless. 
Also, while we're on the subject of percentage retention figures, those percentages look a bit suspiciously round and neat to me. Given this concern, I think it's time we turn our attention to the evidence base for the learning pyramid. Those retention figures must have been derived from a substantial body of data from published research, right? The sheer number of versions of the learning pyramid that exist and the fact that many of them don't identify their source makes trying to track down the evidence base quite difficult. Lettred in 2012 identified a particularly prominent version of the learning pyramid that's attributed to the National Training Laboratories. He contacted them and inquired about the evidence base for their learning pyramid. And they got back to him and said, yes, we did develop that version of the learning pyramid back in the 1960s, but we can no longer find the evidence that informed it. However, the National Training Laboratories were far from the first authors of a learning pyramid. In a fascinating paper on the origins of the learning pyramid, Lettred and Hernes in 2018 traced the origins of the learning pyramid back to the 1850s. But amazingly, they were still unable to locate any substantial body of evidence upon which any of them were based. Almost unbelievably, and despite their ubiquity, even in academic and educational circles, it would seem as if the learning pyramids are not informed by any empirical data. Certainly none that's been identified. Those retention figures that are associated with different learning activities, like a lecture for example, appear to have been, well, just made up. Of course, at this point you might argue that just because evidence for learning pyramids has yet to be uncovered doesn't mean to say that it's not out there. But this is extremely unlikely owing to the third type of problem with learning pyramids. And that problem, quite simply stated, is that they do not reflect what decades of research from cognitive psychology have told us about how memory works. Of course, there's no way I can do justice to the workings of memory in a single video. So let's just focus on one aspect of the learning pyramid that constitutes a fundamental misunderstanding of how memory works. You will notice that the organising principle of the learning pyramid is the nature of the learning activity being undertaken, for example, a lecture. But memory is much less a product of the learning activity being undertaken and much more a product of the quality and quantity of thought that goes into that learning activity. And this is because of something that we've known about memory since the seminal work of Bartlett back in the 1930s. Our memory doesn't work like a camera passively reproducing information. Instead, it actively reconstructs information according to our previous knowledge, expectation and experience. Therefore, to remember something, we have to think about it and how it fits in with our previous knowledge, expectations and experience. Thus, the effectiveness of any particular learning activity is not fixed, it's variable depending on the amount and the quality of the thinking that the learner puts in to that learning experience. We can make this idea a bit more concrete and illustrate it with evidence by focusing on the example of reading. We've known for a good amount of time in psychology that just passively, repeatedly rereading a source isn't a good way of committing it to memory, particularly in the longer term. However, if you set about reading with the goal of questioning and explaining the key parts of the text, then reading suddenly becomes a lot more effective. So, to summarise, the learning pyramid is a completely outdated, broken and wholly unsubstantiated myth about learning. The only reason I can see for its continued propagation in academic circles is, well, I'm afraid to say, likely to be very lazy scholarship. And this is completely unacceptable from those that are involved in teaching and learning. So if you're a student in a lecture, or you're a member of staff attending perhaps a staff training day, or a teaching and learning policy meeting, and the person up front starts talking about the learning pyramid, please do speak up. You deserve better. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please do leave a like. If you haven't already, then why not subscribe to my channel for more information on how psychology can help you study more effectively. Turn on the bell notification if you want to know when I post new content. Thanks very much.